Good morning. Welcome to Camp Lake Baptist for our morning service. Thank you, April, for that prelude. That was beautiful. Of course, that great is thy faithfulness, that last one. So happy you were here. Pastor will be up here shortly to say Happy Mother's Day to you all. But I'll say myself Happy Mother's Day uh, to you all. It's so good to see so many visitors this morning. It's wonderful. Wonderful. Let's take our hymnals and turn to number 375. We like to start out our service with singing, and we will start out with this song this morning. It is well with my soul. Let's all stand up, and we'll sing all four verses of this. You can stand and go ahead and sing. Yeah. 
to sing it remains steady, please. Wonderful, wonderful song. If you know the story of that song, Horatio Spafford lost his daughters out there in the ocean. Wow, what a tremendous faith that man had to write a song like that. Happy Mother's Day, ladies. We're going to honor you in a few moments. We have a special gift for you, but you have to wait for it. It's coming. And uh, let's open in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you so much, Lord, for the tremendous influence that mothers have been in our lives. I think of my mother and grandmother and how much, and both grandmothers, how much they loved you, how much they lived for you, and what an impact that had on my life. I pray, Father, that if these dear folks as mothers are still alive, may they make sure that they express their appreciation and love and thanks for them. Lord, I pray that you would bless the message in a little while because ultimately it all comes back to you, Lord. And we, we want to magnify you this morning and magnify your word. You have said, I have magnified my word above my name. Amen. And we want to magnify your word and its power in our lives. I pray that you would bless our service, bless the message, and bless each person that's here. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. So glad to see each one of you here. Mother's Day it sure is special, isn't it? And uh, I've heard some of you talk about your mothers and how much you love them and how much you miss them. And it's very moving. And I appreciate it very much. This is a nice note from a mother of our church. I'll let you wonder who that is until I get to the end. My wife hates it when I do that. But. A belated thank you for the beautiful bouquet of flowers I received after my surgery. Dorothy, that wasn't so bad. I was able to read your writing. That was okay. <laughs> Dorothy T. Lander. And we're praying for you and Howie. Just want you to know that. Amen. I want to mention something that's coming up. I won't, um, it's not in the bulletin yet, but it will be. On the first Sunday of June, uh, we're going to be honoring our seniors. I have a gift for them. And so that's on the first Sunday of June. But I do want to share with you this morning um, that I received an invitation to uh, Esther's, both her graduation and open house. Her graduation is on June 1st. That's at 7 p.m. for Kent, uh, Kent City uh, High School. And congratulations on uh, finishing your uh, education. And also the, the uh, open house is um, Saturday the 3rd. And that would be probably, what, from 1 to 5? Yeah. Hey, I guessed it right. I, I did read it. I did read it. I just want you to know that. And uh, I also received one uh, from Serena. Uh, was it Serena? Sabrina. 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 I'm sorry. Names are not always coming. I received one from Sabrina as well. She graduates this year. And make sure she knows. I know she's probably helping this morning back there in the church. Make sure she knows about that special Sunday, the 4th. We, we have a gift for her. And uh, when is the graduation for Sparta? It's on Thursday, isn't it? I think it's May 25th, they're graduating. Yeah, the 25th. All right. So did, does she have an open house date? Yeah, we're going to be doing that on uh, July 15th. It's a Saturday. It's going to be in the, at Kent City and uh, PG Leisure Park. Get, get that information uh, written out for me. We'll, she's we'll, passing my phone. Okay, it's wonderful. It's on Facebook as well as an email. All right. So we're thankful for these our graduates this year. Amen? Amen? All right. Well, if you men will be ready, there's a box back there after we sing another song. Uh, be able, ready to help pass out those gifts to the mothers. We'll do that in just a moment. Pastor Mark, what's that? All right. Thank you, Pastor. We are going to sing again. Let's turn over to number 434. Pastor mentioned his mother is gone. My mother is gone to be the glory as well as many of you. Your moms have gone to be the glory. And I think that's why we're singing this song this morning to remind us someday we're going to see them again. Amen. We'll go to this place where the roses never fade. 434. Thank you. 
grab that box. They've got it. All right, ladies, would you stand up? If you're a mother, please stand. All, lady, all mothers, stand. And you can only be seated once you get your gift, okay? So as you receive that, the men will help pass those out. And uh, we're so thankful. This uh, was a, a great and thoughtful thing that um, Julia did for us and to be able to give you mothers. And we're thankful for that. And uh, we pray that will be a blessing to you. And guys, guess what? You have a gift waiting for you too. And uh, when, when Father's Day comes, you're going to receive a gift as well. All right. As you receive those, you can be seated. Yes. That's great. Wonderful. I was telling everybody at Sunday school, I, I tried to be the first one to wish Misty Happy Mother's Day this morning. I texted her, I thought early enough, and I said, was I the first one to wish you Happy Mother's Day? She goes, no, you were the fourth. <laughs> That's okay. It's just a joy. We got to go down and, and see Amos. And by the way, some have asked about... Um, Taylor's little boy, Alicia, she had her little boy Wednesday early, about 12, 18 a.m., little Luke Taylor. We got to hold him last night after uh, the wedding. We went up there and had made arrangements that we could stop by, and we got to see, oh, how tiny. After, after holding Amos, who's just a real chunk, you know, with all these jowls, and, and uh, you know, he's really growing. Of course, he's almost three months old, but... Little Luke Taylor, so tiny and so precious. And uh, very, very, uh, I thought, calm as Mary held him. And uh, what a blessing for Taylor and Alicia Brankma. Their uh, precious child was born this Wednesday. Thank you for praying for her. They appreciate that very much. We sure got a blessing yesterday at uh, Jonathan and Lydia's wedding. So beautiful. Yeah. It was truly a, a blessing. And to uh, hear and see all the things that we saw. It was also neat to hear uh, Jonathan, his brother-in-law, and your daughter Amanda sing. That was a neat surprise. So I, I got a blessing from it all. And uh, we, we sure enjoyed the fellowship with you folks. I know uh, we're excited for them and their new life Amen. and praying for them as they serve the Lord. It's going to be awesome. All right. I want to mention a few things. Uh, I'm sure that there's something I've forgotten, but couple of things to help be reminded. Now, we will be having service tonight at 6 p.m. Traditionally, Mother's Day and Father's Day are the least attended. Why don't you surprise me and make that not so tonight? Come back if you can. I know you might be with your mother, and I won't, I won't be upset about that at all, but we are going to meet tonight at 6 p.m. and have a great service this evening. Now, um, Tuesday night, our prayer uh, and Bible study time will be in Lamentations 4. We're plodding along through a wonderful book, a wonderful and tremendous uh, uh, look into the heart of the weeping prophet, and that is, of course, Jeremiah. And, but that'll be Lamentations 4. And then Wednesday, Youth Group and Truth Night. And uh, we're excited because Stephen and Tanya and Silas and Bo are driving up from Florida. Uh, they're, coming, they're coming sometime Monday or Tuesday, I don't know which. We're looking forward to having them in our service next Sunday morning, and so we're look, I'm excited about that. Now, um, next Saturday, there's a teen bowling at the church at 1 p.m. The first to be a part of the reach out, and then they'll head to Sparta for bowling and ice cream. Notice it says bring $8 for bowling, and hope to see you there. We can use all the help we can get next Saturday uh, that at 1 o'clock for our reach out ministry. It'll mainly be to hang door knockers on doorknobs. And so um, that would be uh, mainly right around the Camp Lake area. And so keep that in mind and pray for it, if you will. Men's prayer meeting is uh, at 8 p.m. There's something else I wanted to mention in the midst of that. Oh, somewhere. It'll come back to me. Um, yes, next Sunday. About next Sunday. Bring your shovel Sunday. Now, somebody suggested that we get some gold paint and paint them all gold. I don't know if I'm worried about that. But if you want to be a part of... Putting that spade in the ground 
and we're going to have a little picture opportunity. We're going to end up putting that on our website. Our website is almost up. Uh, I have pictures that I've taken of the septic system going in, uh, pictures of the trees coming down. But that day, next Sunday, after the morning service, we'll have a brief ceremony of what we call um, groundbreaking, okay? So it's bring your shovel Sunday. You can be a part of it if you bring your shovel. And uh, so that's going to be awesome next week at the end of the morning service. Now, I mentioned to you that next Sunday night, Pastor Mark has agreed graciously, and I appreciate his, uh, his easygoing manner and willingness to do things. I asked him if he wouldn't mind covering for me next Sunday night. We're, we're kind of having a, a hastily thrown together family reunion down at Isaac's church. It'll be like one of the rare times that all four of my children, their spouses, and all the grandkids are going to be together. And so we're going to go to church with them that night. And then we'll be back late, late that night. So pray for us, if you will. That's next Sunday night. There's a teen afterglow after the 28th service. A youth group at the park. Pastor Mark will tell you about that. The 18th, I know it's Father's Day, but that evening... West Coast Baptist College's Redemption Trio will be singing here at our church, and that's at 6 p.m. Looking forward to that. And then the following Saturday, Truth Triumphant Team Conference. And that ought to be easy to remember. I like that. Truth Triumphant Team Conference. And that all starts what time, Pastor Mark? It's going to be 9.30 to 10 registration. Starts at 10, actually. All right. And uh, who is your special speaker? You told me that it hasn't. Brother Mark Chartier. Oh, yeah, Brother Chartier. I don't know why I couldn't remember that. Um, that's going to be a blessing. So be praying for that. I know I know of some churches that are coming, and I'm excited about that. Teens are also going to the Whitecaps on the 30th. Now, this is an important announcement. VBS on the 7th through the 11th of August. Uh, volunteers are needed to help with the Vacation Bible School. If you would like to help, please contact Heather Carew. Finances are also needed. If you'd like to be willing to donate, please put your donation in an envelope marked VBS. All right, thank you so much. Also, summer camps are about to get kicked off. And uh, um, do you have a Spring Fest this year, brother? No. What's the date of that? It's the first June. Okay. First, um, first Saturday. Okay. And also on the weekend of, of um, Memorial Day, that's a, that's a work day up at camp, Fort Faith. So keep that in mind. Also, the summer camp's coming. See Kim if you would like your child to go. And uh, we know that some have been a very big help when it comes to sending kids to camp. We just don't want to take that for granted. We thank Amen. you so much for that. I read this missions minute from Christian Law Association. And isn't it sad, the state of our country? It's sad because Christians are being persecuted more and more. Let's stay the course, Christians. Amen. Let's stay the course. Here's an example right here. Who is, Esther has taken a stand at her school that she's not going to be a part of this fantasy and this ridiculous stuff. She hasn't been mean to anyone, but she's been attacked because of standing in the reality. Standing for reality. Standing for what's right. And it's been rough on her for her senior year to have to go through this from people that used to be her friends have attacked her because she's standing on truth. We have to stand for truth, Christians. We have to stand for truth. We're praying for you. I know it's been very hard. Well, praise God. Uh, he Truth will out, I've always heard. Truth will out. And I think what that means, in the outcome, truth will win. Praise God for that. And I'm getting ready to preach already. <laughs> Come on, men, let's take the offering this morning. Yes. On the um, reach out day, I need everybody that comes to the reach out to be on that end of the church because we have somebody having a shower on that end that day. Okay. So they need to come to whatever. So to this off to my to office. The south, to yeah. the south All right. Door. Thank you for reminding me of that. All right. All right. Let's pray for the offering, Father. Thank you for the giving of your people. Thank you for your promises of. Uh, that you will always meet our needs, uh, as we read in Philippians 4, uh, 19. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Thank you for that promise. Bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
coming up of course the, the event this Saturday but I want to emphasize again mainly the youth conference coming up in June it's going to be a big event hopefully hopefully uh, got a lot of people coming uh, representing the organizations and, and I told you I'm gonna have a sign-up list at the end of the month okay for those who want to sign up to help that day we could use help that day nothing difficult and basically just pointing kids in the right directions and stuff like that all right we can handle those assignments out but I would like to say this, there, also, there is going to be a sign-up list in case you're interested uh, for, for homemade cookies to be made. I'd like to have some homemade cookies that day, just to uh, alleviate the cost in the church and a dessert with a pizza. And then also, if you want to um, if you want to donate some uh, single-wrapped candies, candies, we need some candy for that day, all right? Single-wrapped candy. So if you want to uh, get that, you can start bringing that in if you want to give that to Ben, uh, <coughs> Joseph, or myself, then get ready for, for that, that great day on June 24th. All right, so be in prayer for that. That's the main thing. Uh, 
contacted Brother Chartier this week and we talked and told him we're going to bathe this thing in prayer that this God will do a work in these teens' hearts. Amen. They need the truth. They need the truth. That's why we're calling it the uh, Teen Triumphant. Truth Triumphant Teen Conference. That's what it's called. Truth Triumphant Teen Conference. <laughs> they need the truth. And, uh, we hope they have a desire to, to hear the truth. All right. With that, we're going to have a greeting. But the, the hymn we're going to sing after the greeting is 295, or no, 296. Lord, I'm coming home. 279. Did I get the wrong one again? <laughs> oh, that's a closing hymn. 279. <laughs> 279. I'll get it right. Let's stand and greet one another this morning and make everyone feel welcome.
before that, there's a special number. Kim Yates is going to come. Robert Hester is going to join her.
All right. It's sometimes hard to come up with new messages on Mother's Day. I have to tell you that. The tendency when you're at a place for a long time is to go back and look in the archives. And, well, I haven't preached on Hannah for 10 years. I'll preach on that, you know. But I want to be led of the Lord. I just thank God for uh, giving me some different, some new thoughts. I'm going to go in a new direction today that I don't think I've ever gone. With my memory, it could be that I have preached on this somewhere, but I don't think so. This just seems new to me. And, uh, but anyway, I, I felt like I should break some new ground. But first, I want to I want to recognize a very special mother who poured her heart into being a blessing to the other ladies and mothers of this church. And that, of course, is my wife and the mother of my children, Mary. If you didn't know this, she contacted as many of you ladies as children as she could and got them to write a tribute to you, um, which she read at the last Heart and Home up at the Grant Depot where they met. Well, Mary, Julia suggested to April that she contact her siblings. And <laughs> here are their tributes to you. Dear Mom, it's hard to put into words just what you mean to me. You are not only my mother, my spiritual counselor, an amazing grandmother to my son and my best friend. To say thank you seems so incredibly inadequate. The love and time you have invested in my, into my life and the godly example you have been for me are priceless gifts I could never express enough gratitude for. It is because of your devotion to God that I know and love the Lord with all my heart, soul, and mind. For everything you are and everything you do for our family, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. I love you so much. Love, April. I am so thankful for my mom. She was the example of the virtuous woman. When we were young, she sacrificed all her own wants and needs to provide for us kids. She has served the Lord our entire life. And she, has, she was the most consistent person at doing devotions I've ever seen. She led me to the Lord. I have also witnessed my mom pour her heart into others in a way that few ever do and receive little in return. My mom is the best grandma ever, according to my kids. She lets them eat all the snacks they want. <laughs> she also selflessly loves her grandkids and truly takes time with them when they are together. My mom trained us kids how to work and to be successful in life. I love my mom, and I am thankful to the Lord and proud to be her son. Love, Thomas. Mom. Webster's Dictionary may define you as simply as a female parent, but you give mom its true meaning. I believe that what God had planned before time for all that mother is to be, you have embodied and exampled. Your selfless love and sacrifice, your utmost desire to see your children love and serve the Lord, and your obedience to God's ways have been the best example in my life. Your sacrifice and love have guided me through some of the hardest and greatest times of my life. And I constantly ask myself what my mom would do. The way you fiercely love your grandkids is such an encouragement and joy. I forever appreciate the example you are setting for them. I love that I can talk, call and talk to you about anything, and you are always there for me. I can always count on your friendship. My mom is so much more than just a female parent. She is a wise, discerning, loving, kind, peacemaking, sacrificing, serving, and giving, and so much more. She is a priceless treasure. Thank you, Mom, for all that you are. Much love, Tanya. My mom is a loving, compassionate, and godly mother and grandmother. She worked very hard to provide, nurture, and protect us as well as teach us to love God. I am so grateful God blessed me with her as my mom. Love, Isaac. What was cute was this was an email that April sent me, and she said, here are the letters to mom in order of importance. <laughs> 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 the 
going. My kids are always jostling for the favored status, and it's always funny to hear them do that. Mary, I just want to tell you, <clears throat> Proverbs 31 says it so clearly in that one verse where it says, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. And I think you deserved those tributes. And I wanted to, I know you would never have allowed that. That's why we didn't tell you about it. <laughs> but I'm so thankful uh, for the uh, expressing their hearts to you like that. Amen. Father, please bless this message, Lord. We're not trying to steal the thunder of giving you the honor and the glory. Your word says clearly that no flesh and glory in your presence. But I'm thankful that Julia had this idea because of what Mary did for all the mothers that night, that it was also done for her. And I pray that it would truly encourage her heart as I know it has. Lord, bless the word to us this morning. We thank you. We thank you for mothers. I was thinking about <clears throat> unsung heroes. You've heard of that before. Or in the case of ladies, we're talking about the heroines. The heroines of the Bible. And most of them that are well known, well, that's not who I'm going to focus on today. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I want to focus on some of the lesser known. Some of you may not even have heard of. Some of them we've talked about recently, Mary and I have, because they have such remarkable stories. And um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about seven different uh, females. The reason I say that is because one of them at the time of the writing wasn't an adult, but she bears um, a note. And so I'm going to talk about these seven in the message this morning, and I'm going to talk about them not in order of importance, you can decide that, but in the order of how they appear in Scripture. And that's what I'm going to share with you this morning. I hope it'll be encouragement to you. But first, I wanted to give a shout out for a minute, uh, something that uh, I just was, felt so interesting to think about. I want you to think about four women that helped change the world. And every one of us is related to them, but they don't have any names in the Bible. Do you know what I'm talking about? Noah's wife, and Shem's wife, and Ham's wife, and Japheth's wife. These women who were along with Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth were on that ark. And they were helping to take care of animals. They were dealing with this giant boat, which surely was rocking in the waves of the flood as the floods come up on the earth. I don't doubt it for a minute, folks. That really happened. That's not a fable. What's a fable is evolution in all of the millions of years. That's a fable. The truth of God's word, and it is, it really happened. But I was thinking about these four women who weren't named in the Bible. We're going to meet them someday, and we'll find out what their names are. Isn't that going to be interesting? These four women, wives, mothers, who, wow, think about it. Genetically, we're all related to them somehow. And, uh... At all, you know, he said, well, we go all the way back to Adam and Eve. Yeah, but the thing is, there was a pitch point called the flood and the ark. And so everyone here is related to these uh, four women. And I think it's, it's good that uh, we mentioned them in a, in a message like this, because I don't think we've heard too many messages about the women of the ark. I don't know. I've never heard one. Have you, Pastor Mark? No. So that was just a shout out, not really a message, if you will, but... You know, this list of unknowns could go quite long. And, and to use the, uh, the writer of the Hebrews phrase from chapter 11, verse 32, the time would fail me to tell of, as he's, he said there, uh, Gideon and Barak, and he went, but the time would fail me to tell you of all of them. And you wouldn't put up with it. You got to go take your mom out to eat after church, right? Or do something for her. So time would fail me. So I need to get right into it, all right? First one, I want you to go back to Exodus uh, chapter 1. I want to talk about two ladies, Exodus 1, and here's their names. So these are the first two, Shipra and Pua. You might say, ha, ah, what kind of name? You know, I notice, I'm starting to see, and I'm not on uh, social media that much, but once in a while I catch something on the news or some something, I'm starting to see women are actually naming their daughters Jezebel. You know, it's almost like a it's almost like a defiant. Well, we were, so what that she was the most wicked woman in the Old Testament? I'm hearing the people naming. 
Uh, I don't. I haven't known any Shipras or Puas. Have you? Anybody heard anybody name their child that? I, but that would be a worthy name in light of their um, personalities and in light of what they did. Let's look at it in Exodus chapter 1. Bears the uh, reading, the story. I'm going to pick it up in 15. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shifra, and the name of the other, Pua. And he said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then shall ye kill him. But if it be a daughter, then shall she live. Now let this sink in for a minute. Imagine the pressures that are on these women when the basically the king of the land, we're talking Pharaoh, right? I mean, this is the king of Egypt. Pharaoh, he calls them in and says, kill the, kill the males. You can keep the girls alive and kill the males. Reminds me of Acts where the men who were told stop preaching in his name. And they said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Let's read on. But the midwives feared God. Amen. That is it right there. What I said to my wife a while ago, what I can say to many of you women. But a woman that feared the Lord, she shall be praised. These two women are forever enshrined. Forever, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. These two women are forever enshrined in scripture as a reminder of someone who feared the Lord. So they didn't do it. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men, children alive. I have been with a couple of men childs this week. They're so precious. We got to hold Amos several times. Watch my wife cooing and talking to him and him talking back and holding him and having him staring at me. And looking at that little guy last night, so tiny, Taylor's little boy, Luke. And I realized how precious all babies are. Uh, by the way, I've said this to David several times. Rachel, congratulations on the birth of Mariah. Uh, I didn't want to say the wrong name. Uh, congratulations on her birth. And uh, look at her sitting there so nice and, and calm and quiet, at least for now, huh? <laughs> it's good to have you guys here today. God bless you. We are thankful. Uh, we don't mind if it's a boy or a girl. Amen? Amen? I'm so glad we don't have a policy like they had in China. Mike was talking to me about this yesterday. Uh, the, in China, for a while, they had the policy of one child. Forced abortions. How wicked, how evil. And this was, in essence, forced abortion or forced infanticide. Because he wasn't talking about committing abortion. He was talking about killing the baby after it's born. I love life. How about you? Amen. I can't imagine what it must be like. And I'm not going to go into gory detail, but I'm just going to say I can't imagine what it must be like for these people that kill babies. How can they even lay their head on a pillow at night? How can they sleep? Babies are so precious. Yeah, they're still, they're sinners. They were born with a sin nature. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. It didn't mean that it's a sin to conceive. But even in the earliest of forms, he was a sinner because he inherited that sin from Adam and Eve. And so we know they go forth from the womb speaking lies. Oh no, pastor, not my child. Misty was telling us a funny story the other day. She goes, she couldn't believe it. She was doing something with Amos. And he went, mm. <laughs> he gritted his, he don't have teeth yet, but he gritted his mouth and he chipped his arms like to say, no. Can you believe a little baby would do that? It's because they're sinners and they need Christ. And we prayed for that little guy last night as we held him and, and prayed with uh, Taylor and Alicia about that God would save that little boy when he, at an early age and use him. The, the babies are precious. And these women recognize that. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have ye done this thing and have saved the men children alive? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass, here's the last verse I want to read, because the midwives feared God, 
that he made them houses. Don't lose sight of that reward. Sometimes God gives a reward in this life. He made them houses. So they were blessed because they feared the Lord. Not well known. You might have thought, I've never heard of Shifra and, and Pua. Well, put them up there on, a, elevate their status a little bit in the women of the Bible because they deserve it. They feared the Lord. Secondly, let's go to 2 Kings. 2 Kings. And we're going to be in chapter 5. We're going to be in 2 Kings a couple of times, but 2 Kings chapter 5. I love this story. And I love it because it's amazing God's power for healing. And this is the story of Naaman. You know, Naaman, he wasn't the king of Syria, but he was a captain. It says he was a great man, a captain of the host of the king of Syria. So he was one of the king of Syria's right-hand men. Let's start reading in verse 1. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. Did you see that right there? <laughs> the Lord had given deliverance to Syria through this man. Don't forget, the Jews are related to the Syrians. Don't forget that Rebekah came uh, from Syria. And when the man that went, the servant of Abraham, uh, went up there to get her for Isaac, she was a Syrian and married Isaac. Laban was a Syrian. And there are some other examples in the Bible about how that these countries are related. Isn't it interesting? But the Lord had given deliverance. He was also a mighty man of, in valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and by brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. The reality of war. The reality of slavery. Not only then, but now. The Bible doesn't say slavery is right. The Bible doesn't put a stamp of approval on slavery. The Bible meets people where they are. It even talks to slaves. When you read uh, the book of Philemon and talk about Onesiphorus and Onesimus and those men back there. And you see where if somebody's a slave, even where they're at, in whatever state you're in, you're still supposed to serve the Lord. And so slavery is a reality. This little maid, man, just think about her mom and dad. Worried, sick. Maybe they were dead, but they lost a little girl. She was taken away. A little maid. Taken. And it says, and she waited. Verse 2, and she waited on Naaman's wife. So she was her servant. And she also, and she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Isn't it neat when some people just have plain old, outright faith? Yeah. You know? Let's read the rest of the story, though, make a comparison. And one went in and told this Lord, saying, Thus and thus saith the little maid, the maid that uh, is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Notice how this, this spread like wildfire. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. I mean, he's, he's trying to buy a cure. Think about this. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now, when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have wherewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him out of his leprosy. And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man does sin unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, that see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. So the king didn't have the faith of this little girl. And he's looking at this as a purely uh, picking a fight, purely uh, a situation like that. But Elisha heard about it. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come on to me. And he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. 
So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elijah. And Elijah sent a messenger unto him saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth. He got ticked about this. It says, and went away and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call the name of, his, of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farfar far rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, thou would have not have done it. But how much rather than when he said to thee, wash and be clean. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him. And he said, behold, now I know there is no God, that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. And now, therefore, I pray thee. Take a blessing of my servant. I don't need to read the rest of it. But look at how not only healing came, but salvation came to this man's heart. All because of a little girl. I mean, that's transforming. That's life changing. A little girl. No, we don't know her name either. She's no different than, than uh, Noah's and Shem's and Ham's and Jacob's wives. We don't know their names. We don't know this little slave girl's name. But she had faith. She had the faith to say, why don't you go talk to the prophet in Samaria? And it happened. Wonderful. Stay in Kings with me. Second Kings, I should say. Go over to chapter 11. Second Kings chapter 11. Have you ever heard of Jehoshaba? How many of you, before I said it today, how many of you heard of Jehoshaba? Okay, not too many hands have gone up. Jehoshaphat. And when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal. Now you have to understand who Athaliah is. Uh, she's related to Jezebel. I'll just tell you that, okay? She's related to Jezebel and Ahab. I believe she's a daughter, if I'm not mistaken. She could be a, a distant, more distant, but she is a wicked individual. And when you re realize something here, this woman is actually the grandmother of the young boy that we're talking about. It just astounds me. Those statements by my children about their mom being such a great grandmother. And I never had, I was afraid of my mom many times. Not too afraid of Granny, a little bit, when she had a switch in her hand. I never feared Grandma. Grandma was the one that, the only thing I feared was kissing her if she didn't get that snuff wiped off her lips, okay? But she was the one that cut my hair. I didn't ever fear her. I knew she loved me. Uh, imagine being afraid of your Grandma. Look at this lady. I, I won't use that term. Look at this woman, Athaliah. She wasn't, she was no lady. She arose and destroyed all the seed royal. But Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, see how there's relation. Ahaziah was Athaliah's son, and Ahaziah's sister was this Jehoshaphat. So it's just hard to grasp. Is this her mother? You know, there was a lot of uh, multiple marriages and things back there, so it's a little hard to decipher. But she took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons, which were slain. I think he had something like 70 sons. So he'd have multiple wives, of course. So undoubtedly, Jehoshaphat to Joash was a cousin, first cousin. And they hid him. Even him and his nurse in the bedchamber from Athaliah, so that he was not slain. Talk about right under her nose. He was kept in the temple region. And he was with her hid in the house of the Lord six years. Get, grasp that. All the ways that she had to make sure. Imagine her telling him, be quiet. You can't, be, you 
can't be screaming. I mean, this kid must have had a muffled childhood growing up. You can't be, you can't be that loud if she finds out you're here. Today. Imagine that. Six years. And Athaliah did reign over the land. This wicked, wicked woman. She was all about power. And isn't that what's going on with so many people today? These people don't care about Americans. They care about power. They don't care about little children. They wouldn't be for force feeding these ridiculous lies and causing kids to have wicked surgeries to change their gender. All for that point. They're, they care about power. That's all they care about. And they are cursed, let me tell you. Like this woman, she was cursed. And the seventh year, Jehoiada sent and fetched the rulers over hundreds with the captains and the guard and brought them to him into the house of the Lord and made a covenant with them and took an oath of them in the house of the Lord and showed them the king's son. Kind of like a, a coming out here, a surprise. Hey, we still have the king's son. We have the heir to the throne right here. And... He commanded them, saying, This is the thing that you shall do. A third part of you should, that enter in on the Sabbath shall keep the keepers of the watch of the king's house. And a third part shall be at the gate of Sir, and a third part at the gate behind the guard. So shall you keep the watch of the house, that it be not broken down. And two parts of all shall go forth on the Sabbath. Even they shall keep the watch of the house of the Lord about the king. And you shall come to pass, you shall come, and ye shall come pass the king round about, every man with his weapons in his hand, and he that cometh within the ranges, let him be slain. And be ye with the king as he goeth out, and as he cometh in. And the captains over the hundreds did according to all the things that Jehoiada the priest commanded. And they took every man, his men that were come into the, on the Sabbath with them that should be go out on the Sabbath, and came to Jehoiada the priest. And to the captains over hundreds did the priest give David spears, and shields that were in the temple of the Lord. And the guard stood, every man, with his weapon in his hand, round about the king, from the right corner of the temple to the left corner of the temple, along by the altar of the temple, in the temple. And he brought forth the king's son, and put the crown upon him, and gave him the testimony, and they made him king, and anointed him, and they clapped their hands, and said, God save the king. And when Athaliah heard the noise, of the guard and of the people. She came to the people into the temple of the Lord. And when she looked, behold, the king stood by a pillar as the manner was, and the princes and the trumpeters by the king, and all the people of the land rejoiced and blew with trumpets. And Athaliah rent her clothes and cried, Treason! Treason! But Jehoiada the priest commanded the captain of the guard, the officers of the host, and of them have her forth without the ranges, and him that followeth her kill with the sword. For the priest had said, Let her not be slain in the house of the Lord. And they laid hands on her, and she went by the way by the by the way by the which the horses came into the king's house, and there was she slain. So this wicked grandmother who killed all of her own grandsons missed one of them, all because of Jehoshaphat, who had great faith who risked her own life. Think about it. She risked her own life to protect this little boy and raised him and right under her nose. Wow. Jehoshaphat, a worthy woman to be on this list. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Let's look at another one. So the last three are in the New Testament. Let's go over to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. You ever wonder sometimes, you know, how did they, how did the Lord meet all of his needs? Of course, you know, he told Peter to go fishing and he got a coin out of a fish's mouth to pay his taxes. I've been fishing for my taxes ever since. But I'm just kidding. Um, the Lord didn't need anything in the sense of that he couldn't make, but he didn't operate that way. He was in... He was human as well as, as, as deity, you know? He was very God. And that meant that he put himself under all the things that we are under, which meant he hungered. He was in need. He was in want. He said, the birds of the air have nests, the foxes have holes, and the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. And so he hungered. He was with, in, in need. He went through things. But once in a while... 
something wonderful happened when a person got saved and it really made a difference for the ministry of the Lord. And this is an example. And it came to pass that afterward that he went through every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God and the 12 were with him. And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, she's a famous lady in the Bible, we know that, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered to him of their substance. I want to key on this Joanna for a minute. This is the um, fifth of the names, Joanna. Joanna, obscure in a way, that she's mentioned several times here in the Bible, but she was Chusa's wife, and Chusa was Herod's steward. In other words, he was a high official in Herod's cabinet. He was a high official in Herod's administration. So he was well-to-do. He, he had plenty. He didn't have to worry about finances. He had a worthy and a desired position. And so his wife, um, she's well off. She has plenty. And notice how it says in Joanna. And we, um, go over to chapter, same book in Luke, chapter 23. <clears throat> when I say obscure, because she's not mentioned a lot, and there's not a lot of um, editorial comment about her, but she's mentioned. In 23, go all the way down to 55 and 56. And the women also which came with him from Galilee followed after and beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the command. So that's telling us the women. But then when you go to chapter 24, it says, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came into the sepulcher bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna the Mar and Mary the mother of James and the other women that were with them which told these things unto the apostles. This Joanna, she was just as much there as Mary Magdalene. Joanna, she was just as much there as Mary the mother of Jesus and these other Marys. Obscure, not well known, but she ministered unto his needs and under his, uh, it, I didn't read that passage, but it's back there earlier in Luke. She ministered unto the needs of the Lord. And she was with him all the way through his ministry, all the way on, at the cross and on the resurrection day. A woman of means. Sometimes God uses extremely poor people. We see that in the scriptures. Sometimes he uses rich people. And uh, I think it's uh, wonderful to see that her name, too, is enshrined throughout Scripture for eternity, Joanna. We have Shifra, Akua, Naaman's slave girl, the little maid, Jehoshaphat, Joanna. The last two are found in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, a little more well-known, but some of you might not remember them. If I were to ask you, tell me, who are Timothy's mother and grandmother? Many of you would know. I would get them backwards sometimes. I have to go look at it and not call the you know, one the wrong. I know his mother's name is Eunice and his grandmother's name is Lois. Let's read about that. It's found in 2 Timothy 1 and <clears throat> verse 5. He says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, this is, a, this is a great statement by Paul about Timothy. Unfeigned faith. You know what that means? Real. Not fake. Not putting on a show. Not having a facade. Not being a chameleon that blends in with Christians at church, but blends in with the wicked world when you're out there. No. Unfeigned faith. That was what Timothy had. But where did he get it? 
which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice. And I am persuaded that in thee also. I remember somebody came up, came up with a song, I Have a Godly Heritage. Powerful song. Do you have a godly heritage? If you don't and you're saved, just still be thankful that you're saved. We, we can't always, we don't choose our mothers, do we? We don't choose the lives of the, the, the families we come into. And I was just listening the other night, listening to Barb talk about her mother, uh, Lorraine Peterson. She's going to be 94 when? This month, this month or next month? No, she's already had her birthday this year. Okay. But I didn't realize that we were talking the other night that she's adopted. She was just expressing, she's glad that her mom chose her. And many mothers that have adopted babies, they deserve applause. Amen. Amen. All of the throwaways out there, all of the murders and mothers that want to adopt and want to take. I just remember the wonderful relationship I had with my step-grandmother. There was no step-grand, I was no step-grandson to her. I was her grandson. I can still see her. <laughs> she couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. And she sang every Sunday in the church choir. You could hear her too. <laughs> Boy, did that woman love to fish. She would stand there with her scarf and her straw hat with a green visor open on it. And she'd stand there with her little level rind reel. Remember those level rind reels? The, the thing goes back and forth, and she had her black braided line back in the day. And she'd be standing there by the bridge at the Melbourne Causeway down there in Florida and catch an angelfish. That was her favorite fish. She'd catch angelfish. and have a bucket full of them. I'd be playing around and and um, messing around, you know, and I remember stepping on a catfish and the spine went right through my tennis shoe, right in my foot. She said, come here. And she took my shoe off and my sock off and she took the belly of that. She was one that believed in these old wives' tales, okay? She took the belly of that slimy catfish and rubbed it on the wound of my thing. Well, it got infected. <laughs> she was trying to help. She thought that would help it get better. I love those memories of standing there fishing. And I can still go into that house and smell the fish cooking, the grits, the hoe cake. Every time I would go in there, it would be something. Something wonderful and delicious. On the one hand, some people in the family didn't like her cooking. I didn't complain about it. <laughs> How many of you know what fat back is? Fat back bacon. You know, it has a rind on it. Kind of have to, it kind of breaks in your mouth as you eat it, but it's thicker. Always had fat, fat bacon. And go in that house and, hey, darling, I'm glad that you got to meet her. And she didn't ever get to meet Isaac, but she sure loved our three little kids when we bring them over. Always have some kind of treat. We made a point to try to go see Grandma Waters on Sunday nights after church when we lived in Melbourne. And those kids still remember that. But she loved the Lord. She raised five boys. You talk about eating your weight in groceries, let me tell you. The smallest one weighed, I think, 11 pounds when they were born. All five were over 11 pounds. I don't know how she did it, but she had some funny ways and I loved her so much. She was truly one of these Loises in my life. I'm so thankful for her. No, I wasn't a step-grandchild to her. I was her grandchild. And she was, she made me feel so loved. Isn't that great to have that kind of a relationship with a grandmother? So he says, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice. You know, the, the scholars say, that Eunice, because she was married to a Greek man, most likely he had been killed. That she was probably a widow, and that these two ladies raised Timothy. Whether that be the case or not, but imagine 
a single mother with the help of her mother raising a boy in that world back then. It wasn't any worse than it is here today. It, I mean, it wasn't any uh, better than times are today. You think these are bad times? It was bad then, too. The influence of paganism on the world was so bad, and probably worse than it hasn't gotten as bad as it's going to get here in America. Imagine a single mother, and maybe with just the help of her mother, raising a child in this day. Unfeigned faith. And that's why I want to say, no matter all of this stupidity, insanity, and garbage that the world is touting out there, Let's, let's land on the rock of the truth of God's word. Let's praise these mothers who are full of faith, who are examples to us of unfeigned faith, who make a difference in people's lives. I know that they have in mine, and I'm sure that they have in you. If you're not saved today, there was a song that they used to sing when I was a kid. I don't hear too many people singing it now. They kind of a tear jerking song. Tell mother I'll be there in answer to her prayer. Please tell my darling mother I'll be there. There is a mother who probably cried herself to sleep many a night because her prodigal son or daughter hadn't gotten saved. She might have went to her deathbed. And it seems the writer of that song is saying, tell mother, I'll be there in answer to her prayer. No greater calling for a woman in this world than to be a godly mother. Amen. Father, thank you for these examples. Yes. Lord, they weren't very well known in the world. They weren't mentioned in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11, but they're still enshrined in the precious word of God eternally and we thank you for the difference that they made encourage these mothers here today Lord that we love them we appreciate them and I pray if there's anyone here that's not saved may they get saved today that they might be able to say that same prayer tell mother I'll be there in answer to her prayer I ask it in Jesus name amen let's amen. stand <laughs> Turn to 296 and read the invitation hymn. 296.